Hey everyone, how's it going? I am here at long last to talk about Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Uh, this novel was published in 1851 and it was widely panned upon its release. Uh, no one liked it, no one reviewed it well. It was a financial flop, it didn't do well, and it basically languished in obscurity for about 75 years almost uh, until its reputation started to uh, be revived in the early 20th century. And in particular, it was actually a book of literary criticism by D.H. Lawrence, of all writers, uh, that sort of helped to revive its reputation. And this book was called Studies in Classic American Literature, and it was published in 1923. And of course, after that, Moby Dick would be established as one of the great American uh, works of literature, one of the great American novels, possibly the greatest American novel of all time. Uh, and to go into what the book is about, if you don't know what it's about, uh, it's from the perspective of this guy named Ishmael, who's a sort of a regular old everyman American guy who for some reason has the name of the older son of Abraham, the son of Hagar, uh, who gets cast out into the desert. Uh, but Ishmael uh, realizes at the very beginning of the novel, in basically the first paragraph of the novel, which is my one of my favorite openings in all of literature, that you know, he, he feels like he doesn't have much direction in life, he doesn't really know what to do with himself, and in the past, when he has felt like that, he has tended to find work on a ship and go out to sea. And so the first 150 to 200 pages is him trying to find work. He ends up in Nantucket, at a, staying in an inn and meeting a guy named Queequeg, who is a Pacific Islander, who is a very experienced whaler, and with whom uh, Ishmael strikes up a close friendship, uh, possibly slightly more than friendship, as per some suggestively described scenes in which they are sleeping in the same bed together. Uh, but eventually the two of them uh, find work on a ship, on a whaling ship called uh, the Pequod, which is which, which, which is packed, captained by a guy named Ahab, who has only one leg, which was taken off by a whale, a white whale named Moby Dick, of course. Uh, and Ahab remains kind of mysterious in this first part of the novel. We don't see him until about a third of the way through this novel. And I mean, it's a big, big novel. My edition is 800 pages. A lot of other editions are 600 plus pages. Uh, but this first part of the novel reads a lot more like the books that Herman Melville wrote before Moby Dick. Uh, you know, th those books tended to be, my understanding, I haven't read them, but my understanding is that they tended to be much more sort of gripping adventure stories that tended to be these seafaring stories that took place in exotic locations. Uh, and th th those f these first parts of Moby Dick read a lot more like that. And so they're incredibly gripping, incredibly fun to read, uh, and actually very funny. Actually, all of Moby Dick is quite funny. There's uh, stuff ranging from slapstick to wordplay uh, to, 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 to all sorts of things. But once uh, the Pequod sets out, once uh, Ishmael and Quique get on the Pequod, and it sets out to see, it seems like the whole narrative style of the book also kind of is set out at sea because all of a sudden once the Pequod sets out from Nantucket Moby Dick just gets very very weird very very quickly so you know uh, we suddenly get all of these chapters that are written in different styles you know all of a sudden we get this chapter that's written in the form of a play basically with each member of the Pequod speaking each crew member of the Pequod saying something to each other and we in that chapter is very interesting because we get a sense of just how uh, racially and ethnically and nationally diverse the Pequod is, you know, there, there are there are black crew members, there are Native American crew members, there are Chinese crew members, there are crew members, there's obviously Queequeg, who's a Pacific Islander, there are crew members from all over the world, from all sorts of different countries, um, and you do, I think, get a sense in this novel that it has a very kind of egalitarian mind behind it, you know, because Frequently throughout the novel, the common humanity of all these people from these different nationalities and these different races is emphasized most explicitly in the case of Queequeg, you know, because he is portrayed in a very sort of exoticized way uh, as a quote-unquote cannibal, uh, which which may be sort of fictional uh, in terms, of, but it but it was probably how a lot of people thought of people from the Pacific Islands. But that isn't that isn't taken as a as a reason to look down upon him. You know, again, Melville frequently emphasizes that, in fact, uh, Queequeg and Ishmael feel a kinship with each other. They realize that they are both human beings and that's really what matters. And I feel like that's actually a really interesting subtext of the whole novel. Um, 
But anyways, to get back to my point, you know, uh, in terms of these stylistic variations in this novel, we get uh, chapters that are in the form of monologues from several different characters. Uh, so it'll, there'll just be one part of the chapter that's Ahab speaking for a long time, then one part that's Starbucks speaking for a long time. Uh, we get a lot of chapters that have stage directions, which is certainly very interesting, and I think speaks to a kind of a st uh, uh, influence of Shakespeare on this book, heavily influence of Shakespeare. Uh, you can see, you know, Shakespearean cadences throughout the book, especially in a lot of the uh, monologues and soliloquies that are given. Uh, some chapters seem to be written in the form of almost a platonic dialogue, although usually what's being spoken about isn't what a platonic dialogue would usually be spoken about. It's usually spoken about, like, you know, Ahab's wooden leg or something, instead of, like, the meaning of life or something like that. And so there are all these really uh, weird stylistic variations uh, in this part of the book and for the rest of the book, basically. And what's also weird about the narration of the book is that Ishmael, who is our ostensible first-person narrator, basically disappears from the narrative for long stretches. You know, he he be, he becomes much less of a subjective protagonist. You know, he becomes much less of a protagonist from whom we're getting the subjective perspective and much more of a sort of omniscient narrator. You know, he, he will say he would talk about events that he could not possibly have really been privy to, you know? Uh, and, I don't know, that's kind of one of the one of the weird things about Moby Dick, you know? It, it definitely suggests that Ishmael himself is a basically a stand-in for Herman Melville uh, more than he is, like, supposed to be a, a real character. But anyway, so then finally we do meet Ahab, Captain Ahab, who is probably certainly the most famous character from this book. And, you know, he, you know, even his crazed monomaniacal quest I think could be seen as quite as the subject of quite a conventional story you know you can imagine just a like a 200 page novel about this crazed captain's desire to hunt this whale that leads to disaster uh, but still it's something much more than that you know uh, Ahab to me is like the the most American character uh, I've ever encountered you know because he so he obviously had his leg taken off by the white whale, right? And he is thirsty for revenge for that on Moby Dick. Uh, but, you know, it's emphasized throughout the novel that he is being incredibly prideful and egotistical for thinking that this white whale, who's a, you know, just a, a wild animal, even knows who he is or cares about him. You know, it's actually said at several points that it's blasphemous for him to do that. But he thinks that Moby Dick is his arch enemy, and he seems to think that Moby Dick really wants to get him, and he certainly wants to get Moby Dick. And to think that, you know, what you're doing is, you know, the most important thing in the world, and that everyone is out to get you, and you need to, you know, fight quote-unquote evil, um, and, you know, even to the uh, detriment of the others around you. I don't know, it seems like a very American thing to me for often worse, but sometimes better, I guess. Uh, and so Ahab, I think, is just a crucial uh, American character for me. Uh, but he has this magnetic effect on uh, everyone he meets, and I think he is difficult to not be somewhat attracted to, you know? I think he's one of those characters who we can sort of scoff at him, but I think, uh, to use a, a term from, or, or, or a phrase after he replied to a Gatsby from The Great Gatsby, uh, we, we scoff at him on his own liquor, you know? Uh, he's a character that I think we all sort of develop some sort of a begrudging respect for in his just, you know, yeah, in his laser focus on his quest. But he's a really interesting character, you know, he seems to almost be like the god of the Old Testament uh, to his crew, uh, but he doesn't have all the supernatural powers of the god of the Old Testament, but he wishes he does, which again speaks to his sort of monomania, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, so Anyway, so Ahab certainly is an interesting character, but he's not the only character. You know, I've already touched on Queequeg and Ishmael. Queequeg certainly is a great character, uh, but there's also Starbuck, who is sort of the Sancho Panza to Ahab's Don Quixote. Uh, there's Stubb, who is sort of a character who wishes he was in a comedy, uh, and he's, he's certainly a lot of fun. There's uh, another character uh, named Pip, who is this uh, black boy who is on, on the ship, who at one point has a an accident while... Uh, on a whaling trip, he gets in a boat to go kill, to help a crew kill a whale, and he accidentally falls off, well, actually, he jumps off the boat, and then while he's sort of floating there, treading water, he looks down to the bottom of the ocean, and the sort of massive entities he sees there drive him mad, uh, and that's a really 
interesting scene, and Pip is such an in interesting character. And, you know, Pip is a great example because he he only appears for like one chapter, really. He only he only has his character arc over one chapter, and yet he feels like a fully human, fleshed out person. And that's something that Melville is great at. Uh, and Pip, that scene is also really interesting because I think it speaks to uh, a sort of Lovecraftian element in this book. You know, I, I made a video earlier this week about how Moby Dick can be seen as a form of science fiction. And I think that, and I, I would stand by that. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna say that it should be like reclassified as science fiction, certainly, but that's the lens you can look at it through. Uh, and, you know, when you think about the relationship between this crew and the white whale, Moby Dick, who is sort of a god among godlike beings, uh, it's similar to the relationship between people and the entities in Lovecraft's stories, in like the Call of Cthulhu and so on. Uh, and so there's there's that sort of existential element to it as well. Uh, and, and yeah, and that is, again, to, to continue talking about the whales, you know, that is really driven home, I think, in the so-called whaling chapters. You know, there, there's these many chapters that are just all about whales, all about whaling. Uh, Melville basically writes or tries to write an encyclopedia of whales and whaling, uh, as he understood it, obviously. A lot of the science of whales has progressed from the time when he was writing, uh, but his insights into whaling are certainly very interesting. I actually find the, the chapters about how a whale is killed, how the oil is extracted from the whale, how the fat is taken off the whale, I find all that just absolutely fascinating for some reason, in a like, weirdly morbid way, because obviously whaling is a, is a horrible practice that has you know, led led many species of whales to the brink of extinction, but I just take a weird, morbid fascination in how this is done. Uh, and one of my favorite chapters is when Stubb uh, has the cook on the Pequod fix him a whale steak. He has him, he, he, he has him cook up a slab of meat from a whale and just complains and complains about the way the cook um, fixed it. And I don't know why I love that chapter, but it's just so funny to see Stubb trying to eat a whale steak and like, Mel in the narration, Ishmael is like, yeah, well, whale meat doesn't actually taste that good, but anyway, Stubb for some reason wanted to eat it. Uh, and then Stubb is complaining to the cook about how he fixed it, and then he makes the cook eat a bite of what he's fixed him, and he says, so how does that taste? And the cook, cook just says, that's the best steak I've ever tasted. And then Stubb is like, well, then you don't know how to cook. Uh, and I don't know why I love that chapter, maybe because I'm kind of a food nut and I just love eating, but anyway. So I, I really love those whaling chapters just in and of themselves. I find them amusing and interesting. Uh, I, I I think that the whales too, uh, you know, and, and I should say too that the actual uh, narration of the hunting of the whales is thrilling to read. It's really gripping. Uh, and you know, there are those final three chapters at the end when the crew of the Pequod is trying to hunt Moby Dick. And that, that those are also absolutely thrilling. You know, they're, they're, the, they're the climax of the novel, of course, uh, although they only take up like you know, maybe, maybe 5% of it. <laughs> um, they are thrilling to read. Uh, but, you know, the whales are metaphorically very interesting as sort of symbols, right? Um, I think you can see them as a metaphor for a lot of different things, you know? They're, they're sort of this metaphor for, you could say God, but you could also say just sort of a, a fundamental mystery at the heart of the universe, sort of this, this desire for knowledge that we humans have and our... Uh, anxiety about the fact that we can never quite have perfect knowledge, you know, because you can see Melville trying to, you know, encapsulate all the knowledge you have about whales in this one book and not, probably not quite succeeding. Uh, and so the whales seem like the stand-in for this fundamental mystery at the heart of the universe where we don't really know what's going on and why we're here. Uh, and that can be seen as sort of the existential source for the idea of God, although I don't think it needs to be seen as like a direct metaphor for God. Uh, and you know, th there's what, what I think complicates that idea is the fact that it's also emphasized at several points that whales and humans are not actually all that different. So that's certainly interesting. So the whales are mysterious and awe-inspiring and perhaps a metaphor for God, and we're told that they're very similar to us in many ways. And so what does that say about us? You know, we, we ourselves are also unknowable. And, you know, I think that that goes back to the very deep exploration of character we see in many of the different characters, but especially in Ahab. Uh, but, you know, whaling itself is also, it's also kind of 
its own metaphor, right? You know, you can think of it as kind of Sisyphus pushing his, his boulder up the hill and watching it fall back down and pushing it back up, you know, because when you're on a whaling expedition, you go and you hunt a whale, great, you've got a few barrels of, of oil, but then what do you do right after that? You just go and you find another whale and hunt another whale, you get some barrels, and then once you once you get all the barrels full, you go and you sell it, and then what do you do? You just go back out and keep whaling. It, it's, it's, you know, basically this metaphor for just human life and human toil. Yeah, and you know, I think Moby Dick himself, you know, the title character, so to speak, uh, is is such an interesting symbol, because I think he's open to so much interpretation. You know, I think the best works of literature suggest things. They don't say outright, here's what you need to think, here's what this is. They suggest things, and there's a lot that's suggested about Moby Dick that isn't quite solid, right? But I think that the way people respond to Moby Dick within the narrative is in a sense a Rorschach test for them, for their character. You know, because so Ahab, right? Ahab wants to kill the whale, right? It's his one goal in life. He doesn't even care about the oil, the way selling the whale oil that he's, uh, that the crew has acquired. He just wants to kill the whale, even at the expense of the crew. Uh, and that's his response to Moby Dick's power over him. You know, in, in a sense, we can see his lost leg as a symbol of Moby Dick's power over him. Whereas someone like Starbuck, who is constantly trying to moderate Ahab, trying to, to reason with him, say, okay, but, you know, you're supposed to be, you're on a contract for three years to do to do some whaling, to make some money getting whale oil. You know, you can't sink the ship trying to hunt this whale. Uh, and also, like, what you're doing is monomaniacal and blasphemous and so on. And so Ahab is sort of, we can see him as kind of someone who would end up probably being like a new atheist. Like, he would be Richard Dawkins, right? He would be the guy who's just like, yeah, God doesn't exist. Uh, I'm just going to do this thing because I, I can and I want to. Whereas Starbuck might be more of a man of faith because he has sort of uh, a, an awe of this creature, uh, of nature, of God perhaps. Uh, and so I think it's very interesting to see Moby Dick as a Rorschach test. And you know, I don't know. You know, put yourself in Ahab's position and think how you would act. You know, would you, were you in the exact same position as him? What would you do? Would you want revenge? Would you flee in terror? Would you uh, just sort of go about your normal business? I don't know, what, uh, that's sort of an interesting question, I think. You know, what, what would you do if you're watching this and you've read the book, or, or you don't really have to have read the book to answer it, but what would you do? Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about was just uh, the influences on this book. You know, it's a, one of those works of literature that I love because it, it wears its influences on its sleeve. You know, it's very ambitious in the, in, in the starting points that it in the literary starting points that it invokes. So, you know, Shakespeare, as I've already said, I think Hamlet and Macbeth are both especially crucial plays for this book. Uh, Don Quixote, which I've also already mentioned, you know, I think Ahab is a kind of, uh, a kind of Don Quixote-like character, and Starbuck is sort of a Sancho Panza, who's sort of his sidekick, sort of looking on and being like, okay, yeah, but you're acting really weird and crazy right now, right? Um, Dante, uh, the Divine Comedy, of course, especially the Inferno, you know, in, in the course of Moby Dick, the Pequod meets nine other ships, nine other whaling ships along its way to finding Moby Dick, and there are nine circles of hell in, in Dante's Inferno, so I think that's an influence. Uh, Paradise Lost, I think Ahab has Milton's Satan just plastered all over him, uh, and then, of course, another thing that I find insanely interesting is just how influential this book has been, of course, uh, you know, uh, from The Great Gatsby, as I've already mentioned, to As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner, which I've just recently read, to something like Blood Meridian, which is very explicit about its uh, influence, I think. Uh, yeah, it's just an incredibly influential book. Uh, but anyway, I thought that I would just leave you at the end here with my favorite quote from the book, uh, which is suitably uplifting. And the quote is this. It, it, the quote comes in a chapter where Queequeg is building his own coffin, and is currently lying down in it, uh, in sort of anticipation of his own death. And this is the sentence, and I think it might be my new favorite sentence of all time. Uh, so here it is, quote, And like circles on the water, which as they grow fainter expand, so his eyes seemed rounding and rounding, like the rings of eternity. Unquote. So, uh, I'll leave it, with, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you all for watching. Give me your thoughts on Moby Dick if you've read it, and I will talk to you all later. Bye.